And the Kiwis win their second consecutive Sail Grand Prix here in Copenhagen. What a masterful performance by Peter Burling and Blair Two. Please join us for the national anthem of New Zealand. Since Plymouth, once the Kiwis cracked the code of the F50, they've just improved and improved and improved. And the thing you need to do to improve is to innovate. And right now, it feels like the Kiwis are just one step ahead of everybody else. I guess they found a, a weakness, a chink in the armour of the fleet. So they took something that they felt they were good in and then just kept working on it and improved it and made it their own style. But in New Zealand, they are a much smaller nation, a lot less people and their goal is to beat Australia at everything and the rest of the world. And so to do that, they have to be very innovative. If you're doing something differently, you're obviously uncovered something. What that is, I'm not sure yet, but they're going quicker and quicker and they're getting pretty dangerous for the Australian team at the top of the podium. That is the secret, tell me. I've asked myself so many times, what is it going to take for Australia to be beaten by the rest of the fleet? And I wonder if it's New Zealand that has found that piece of the puzzle that might knock them off the top of that podium. Well, we're overland in the Barraway. Even if we stayed like within a boat length of one of us the whole way through, we just like, started to come. I've known Pete for a very long time. I mean, one thing that always comes to my mind when I think about Pete as a competitor is his attention to detail with everything he does. Like, for example, he is a perfectionist on the water, whether it's a tactical situation, whether it's a design part of a boat, whether it's his house, you know, he's been renovating his house now for the best part of a year or two. And so often he's talking to a tradie or someone who's just come and put his windows in and he's gone with a laser and he's measured it and the window isn't to the specifications on the drawing. And he'll call them up and tell them to come back and fix the window because in his mind, they haven't done the job properly. That's the type of person Pete is. I think Peter Burling's nature is quite an aggressive. You don't have to be on the water to be feeling the uh, competition. It could be walking home and who's walked the most efficient route back to the hotel. Andy will give him a pretty good run for his money walking home to the hotel. Quite often you'll find those two going stride for stride, not letting you know one person get um, half a foot length in front of each other. I'm more one to be competitive when it uh, really matters, but some people like to be competitive uh, you know, at everything in life. <laughs> They have very different personalities, Pete and Blair. Blair is much more of a personable person. Could I have a picture of you? <laughs> Blair is more about creating the right atmosphere around the team. Blair knows that, you know, to be a successful program, you've got to have the whole package. And that's why they make such a good team. <laughs> First day of the Range Rover France Sail Grand Prix. We've just come off Plymouth and Copenhagen where the Kiwis are dominating and we're here in Saint-Tropez and it's, it's time to find out a piece to the puzzle that's making those Kiwis just go so fast. The Kiwis have started last. Now we're on mark one and oh my, they've already overtaken three teams. They have the speed, they have the confidence. This is an all or nothing team. Yeah, I think if you looked at the, the style of racing, you know, we're not afraid to, to take a risk or to do an extra manoeuvre to, to try and get a pass. Gate two and Team New Zealand's all in. They're overtaking almost the whole fleet. It's a bit like watching Jonah Loma score. You know, when you think about sport in New Zealand, you think about sailing and you think about rugby. And Pete and Blair have this ability to fight hard on a racetrack. And you think about the All Blacks, and nobody wants to go up against the All Blacks, especially if you're an Australian like me. It's, it's always dangerous. Watch the top of the mast here. This is the danger angle with Australia. They've got to keep clearing New Zealand. Oh, oh my word. Ah! Oh, he's had a huge one. Uh, might have broken his nose. Hey, Craig, what New Zealand did there, it's going to break boats, kill people. It's ridiculous. And I think that's what these Kiwis embody, this grit and determination. They're a small nation. They have to fight for everything. And the New Zealand team here at Sao GP are certainly doing that. 
I call it ruthless. I think that Pete is ruthless. I think he just looks at the race and the fleet and is like, this is what I need to do to win. Final leg of race two, and the Kiwis are sailing flat out towards the finish line. Canada must keep clear in New Zealand. New Zealand are through. Canada, oh, yeah, Canada's going to hold it over. It was a very similar thing. Down the last reach, we were kind of overlapped a lot of the Canadians. And then they, you know, lost control and, and just about capsized. Just get it back! <laughs> that was so close. It shows you the different characters when they, they know they're in exactly the same position and, and one of them kind of, you know, <laughs> knows that it's, it's their mistake and, and one of them tries to, to blame the other guy. Tom, uh, did you make the, the piece with, uh, with Peter or you're <laughs> still... Uh, yeah, team. they strategically put Liv in between us, I think, to <laughs> keep us apart. I, I can see his point of view. Uh, I think he sees our point of view, and uh, we're just happy to move on from here. To find the limit, you have to push the limit. And that's what we see with the New Zealand team. They do like to play within the rules, but they still move a little bit beyond the rules every now and then, and that's why they've collected penalty points this season. Two days ago, during the practice, the Kiwis, they were penalised for that minor contact with Jimmy Spittle, but the penalty's gonna be severe. It's gonna cost them valuable points across the board. When you look at this event with Pete, Pete uh, had a mistake on the training day. Before we even start the racing here, he's down four points. That's really costly, and so, some of these teams, yeah, they're, they're right at the top of the leaderboard. They only need a few of those things to happen, random things to happen, a random breakdown, a bad event. And man, in my mind, there's still a lot of racing to go. It was the last day here in Singapore and the New Zealand team, well, they've recovered from that practice race penalty. The team seems to have become so good that they can start behind minus four points and they're still able to comfortably fight for a place in the final. Oh, I just wonder what their secret is. The final piece of the puzzle is that the Kiwi team are reinventing the way that they utilise the six people on the boat. We're going to go to ley line and tack around the left mark and that's what wins the race, OK? Keep it fast. Well, it looks like Switzerland's going to win this race. This is their first one ever in Sail GP. It's great driving by Sebastian Schneider, who's being advised by Nathan Outridge, sitting just behind Seb as the team strategist. Having sailed with the Swiss team this year, being in the P6 a lot, it's amazing what you can see when you can observe the fleet, really look at the software. There are avenues all over the course to make huge gains. But what happens is, is the boats are so difficult to sail Everyone sails around very tunnel vision. Everyone's reacting to what other boats are doing. And so if you can, I guess, increase your bandwidth in terms of what you can see around the course, there are so many opportunities on the racetrack. On the wing of an F50, there's basically a computer screen. And on that computer screen, it gives you lots of information about the race course and what you're getting out of the boat. So what the New Zealand team have done is they've spread the load. Pete's job is to drive the F50 but they're utilising Josh Jr, who's one of the grinders, he's also a world champion sailor, to be able to use that screen on the wing, process all that data, also look at the race course, and provide to Pete just the information that he requires at that point of time. And then, you know, if people don't have to look at the screen, they can concentrate on something else. So if I look after that little area, then Pete can look after another area, Blair can help with another area, and so on. Wow, the Kiwis have qualified for the final, and you've got to take into consideration that they had four negative points from the start. Nice work, guys. That was an awesome race. Well, it's absolutely remarkable how well this team's using all the information at their disposal. Pre-start for the final, and Todd, listen. Listen how JJ is solely concentrated on the software, and on tactics, and the countdown. Good well, the key in the final race in Singapore was just realising what was happening with the wind. Guys changed their starting strategy to make sure we own that lured end. Oh, New Zealand's been in control for the whole final. Their decisions have been perfect and they've been on the foils 100% of the time so far. 
and New Zealand wins the Singapore Grand Prix. That's three Grand Prix wins for the Kiwis and three Grand Prix for Australia. That's as tight as you can get in season three of Sail GP. Well, yeah, Tom Slingsby doesn't have some of his usual crew, but just something tells me that right now the team dynamics of the Kiwis are just one step ahead. Obviously, the Australians are top of the leaderboard at the moment, but yeah, for us, yeah, we've been working hard as a group to, to make sure that you know, if we have a bad race, we can bounce back um, and, and, and win the next one. And you know, I think that's something that I was really proud of, looking back at Singapore, is the way we had a relatively tough build-up, and then the team came out and probably performed the, the best they had. So the New Zealand team, they're in the Adrenaline Lounge celebrating, and other sailors have to sail their boat back. And on the way home, it's like the heavens opened up. Huge noise, instantaneous noise and light as we all spun around and you could see the trail of smoke sort of heading back up to the clouds. This is the medical boat. Martin Kirkater from Tindermark has sustained an electric shock. By the time we got back to the boat, uh, we could see that Martin was in a lot of pain and uh, all the crew were huddled around him. Straight away, his arm was purple. It was quite, um, quite scary. And he was really struggling to, to move his arm. But then over the next few hours, it uh, sounds like he had a, a pretty good recovery. Yeah, he's sta stable. Yep. Well, that was good news. Boat came back to the tech side and you know, immediately sort of seeing it, the boat looked the same, but as the evening went on and then over the next 48 hours, the extent of the damage became apparent and you could see that the current had just gone through everything on the boat. Every metallic part on the boat was showing signs of arcing. Luckily, the way Sail GP works is it's one design, which means all the boats are identical. Canada are lucky enough to get the new Boat 10 and New Zealand for the Sydney event have inherited the Canadian boat. 